What's up? Benson here and welcome to my channel. So quantum computer, the most exciting technology of this century that attracts so many countries to invest in their money and talents. And if you've been following my channel, you can learn all the things that a quantum computer can do and change the world. But after we learn all the things, the next question, or this should be the first question is, how to build a quantum computer. Different than making a classical computer that we can make it small and compact, just like all this. Uh, for a quantum computer, because it requires a super clean environment. What does it mean? It means that it requires vacuum or super low temperature. So that is why you always see a quantum computer look like a giant bucket or a spacecraft return capsule, because those devices are, you know, those external devices are like to keep a very clean environment for the quantum chips or say the qubits inside. But although the classical computer and quantum computer looks different, there's one thing they're in common because regarding the basic structures, they're both composed of two things, the hardware and the software. For hardware, there were four abstract layers. The most fundamental layer is where the qubits lie. And it's the most basic building blocks for quantum computer. In this layer, the qubits will encode information for later uses. The second layer is designed to control the qubits. And the basic control scheme is to use gates. Qubits can be put into superposition and entanglement by these gates that I can show you later. Only having gates to control the qubits is not enough. We need to tell the gates when to operate and how to operate the qubits, right? And that's the third layer, the quantum processor. Okay, I'll make this analogy. It's like in a shootout. Qubits are the guns. Gates are the soldiers and commander is the quantum processor. We cannot just let the soldiers, you know, rush out and shoot randomly. The commander has to allocate and give orders to the soldiers so they can destroy the enemy. The fourth layer, which is the last layer of the hardware, is the user interface, which allows human to control the quantum processor. And this layer is always achieved by using classical computers because the user interface is already very easy to use in classical computers and there's just no need to invent new ones based on new technologies. Okay, let's jump to the software. Actually, software is blended with the hardware to literally every layer. For example, we have to build the dedicated program languages for a quantum computer and after the programmers write the codes and algorithms, we have to use compilers to map algorithms onto the hardware. Sometimes the codes don't work well with the quantum hardware, so we need the debugging tools to fix those issues. Aside from all this, there are optimization tools that can implement algorithms more efficiently and verification tools that can make software and hardware working better with each other. Okay, talking so much about the theory of how to build a quantum computer, the next question is, how exactly can we build a quantum computer? Like how to fabricate qubits? and how to control those qubits physically. So in the next section, I'm gonna introduce two mainstream techniques. The first one is to use zero resistance metals, which is also called the superconductors to build such a machine. And the second technique is to use a strip of ions to build a quantum computer. Let's jump into it. Okay. The first technique that I'm going to introduce is called superconducting quantum computer. When we say the name superconducting, we refer to the quantum computer hardware technology. More precisely, the quantum bit, aka qubit. Qubit is the most tricky part of quantum computer because it's really, really vulnerable and it's easy to you know, interact with the environment and becomes unusable. Actually, there are a lot of ways to fabricate physical qubits as I mentioned in my previous videos, but but superconducting qubit is the most popular technique that most giant tech companies are using right now. For example, IBM, Google, Intel. So you can probably tell why I want to include this technique in this video. But what is a superconducting qubit? The answer is very simple. It's made of superconductors. That's all. If you're interested in details, you can subscribe to this channel because I will make a full video about that. Don't miss it. Okay, once we have the qubits, we have to control them. And here is the quantum processor made by IBM. And these wires are called microwave resonator, which can use microwave. 
yeah, just like the microwave oven microwave to control the qubits. As we know, microwave is very common in our daily life, right? Like the microwave oven and our phone and Wi-Fi. I can't say uh, phone signals and Wi-Fi totally use microwave, but they do use the microwave more or less. So that will affect the superconducting qubit. Because imagine you bring a phone near the quantum computer where thousands of qubits are under operation by microwave. The microwave that your phone emits can somewhat destroy the operation and makes the result useless. So we have to use some bucket to shield the microwave from the outside, like from your phone. And that is why you see the number six is a shield to protect the qubits inside. This diagram is from IBM and found it on their website. This diagram shows the basic structure of the superconducting quantum computer. For example, number two is the input microwave lines to send in the microwave signal and all otherwise and gears are just to make the input signals clean and make sure the output signals are clean too. And this whole machine is installed in a white bucket. The white bucket is not only a bucket, it's actually a refrigerator. Okay, I always got this question. Why don't we just put the qubits on the top so we don't have to reach all the way down there to control them? That's a good question. Because in a room temperature, the signals that we are going to send are noisy. But if we cool them down, it becomes cleaner. And that is why we use this refrigerator. This is actually called dilution refrigerator, which means it will get colder and colder as you walk all the way down. And the bottom is the coldest part. So when the signals you're sending reach the bottom, where the qubits lie, they're super clean and ready to be used to control qubits. Okay, so we now have the quantum computer hardware that is good to go. So it's time to build the software to unleash the power of this beast. And IBM has this full stack quantum software. It's really amazing and I think it's the best quantum service in the world. There are two main sections in the console that you can whether choose to code in the quantum circuit or just use the drag and drop function to create a circuit. I really like the drag and drop feature because it's so intuitive and it has the diagram at the bottom to visualize the simulated qubit state so you can know what you're doing. Okay, that's it. This is not a video about how to use the software. Actually, a more complete intro is included in this video, so make sure you check that out. Okay, except for quantum computers built on superconductors, some companies use ions instead. Let's take a look. The first question is, why use ions? It sounds like an old fashioned way, at least for me, but don't get me wrong because this type of quantum computer is the biggest competitor of superconducting quantum computer because it has this crazy long qubits coherence time that is at least a thousand times better than the superconducting qubits. Okay, back to the question, why use ions? Let's take a deeper look and break it down. Firstly, we have to know what is ion. Ion is like the brother of atom because the ion is formed once the atom loses electrons or gains electrons. For example, chlorine ion is a chlorine atom gaining one electron and sodium ion is a sodium atom losing one electron. And for making a qubit, only positively charged ions are used. And here's a list of a whole bunch of options. Okay. Once we have the ion, the next step is to control it, right? And thanks to the positively charged property of ions, we can use electromagnetic fields to trap them in space, making them floating above the substrate. After that, the laser or microwave can be used to change the status of the ions, and in addition, perform more complicated computation. After the computation is done, the qubit state can be read out also by laser beams. If you're interested in more details, a more complete video is over here, so make sure to check that out. Also, you can find a roadmap on IonQ's website to build such a trapped ion quantum computer. IonQ is a company who builds its own trapped ion quantum computer, and here is its website. As you scroll down, you can see some animations and explanations. So as you scroll all the way down, you can have a better understanding of this whole process. This animation is really beautiful. Yeah. So make sure to check that out. 
Just like IBM, INQ also offers the cloud access to its quantum computer in cooperation with cloud services like Google, Microsoft, and Amazon, which means you can write your own quantum codes and use these cloud services to send your commands to the quantum computer and do quantum computation. But because different than the IBM easy to use software, this software is hard to use and it costs money, so I never use them. Okay, now we know that we can use two different techniques to build a quantum computer, the superconductors and the ions. But there are still some other ways to build a quantum computer, for example, the semiconductor quantum computer. Uh, that is a completely new technology and I'm super interested in that and I'm currently doing a research on that. So I will definitely make a video on that lately. So make sure you subscribe to this channel and stay tuned. That's pretty much it. Thank you guys for watching and catch you guys in my next one.